sound we should only okay But then we wait because we are only us. So let's wait a few minutes because I guess people there is enter in the training session. There are six audience. You can begin. The people are just, they, they could not come before. So they are joining in. Okay. So I cannot see everybody, but thank you to be there. We will start. I guess other people are arriving, but we may start to be sure we are on time. So first of all, happy new year to all the people I did not see before. I'm very happy to be there. And as you see, we have proposed a session on pluridisciplinarity in economics. And it is a, a very plural uh, session because we have three sort of approach. We have one paper who analyzed the different form of relationship between disciplines and their consequences. We have a paper built on bibliometric analysis, not only using also historical economic analysis, but nevertheless, the main contribution is in the use of that bibliometric tools to try to see how uh, the introduction of agent based model uh, are. Um, a vehicle for the pluridisciplinarity in the field of micro or macroeconomics. And finally, we have also a paper which focuses on a specific episode, the one on pluridisciplinarity, which fits the experimental economy. So let's start immediately with the paper by John Davis. The title is Economics and Pluridisciplinarity, Methodological Issues and Future Prospects. I give you the floor. And as we agreed before, I will mention when we are about 20 minutes. Is it there? One idea that you still have five minutes. Okay. Can you see the slide? Yes, yes, John, we can. It's okay. perfect. So uh, I will go slide by slide. There uh, are four sections of the paper. First, I talk about the methodological problem of identifying change in economics and make an argument for explaining change in terms of economics relationships to other disciplines. Then I distinguish four forms of relationships between disciplines, argue that the form that economics currently takes is an unstable form, therefore likely to change or might change, and then use an open closed systems analysis to model how contents cross disciplinary boundaries. Then I move outside of economics to forces that act upon it, and I distinguish two kinds. And then I talk about, finally, how these external forces might influence internal development of economics and its relationship to other disciplines. So the methodological problem, well, people talk about what's new and old, but these are slippery terms. And uh, since economics is always uh, uh, showing change and showing new contents, it's not an easy way to proceed. I characterize this as an inventory method. And uh, two problems, which I can't talk about in detail, are that new may just be repackaged old, uh, new wine, old bottles. Uh, and then what is a sufficient amount of new to say there's change? So historians, I think, look at economics as a whole and uh, see how it affects changes in social relationships and Policy. So Keynesian economics, for example, by changing the role of the state and advancing fiscal policy as a new type of economic policy uh, was a change in economics as a whole. But my method is to talk about, in a more fine-grained way, uh, change in economics as a whole in terms of change in its relationships to other disciplines, and I treat disciplinary identity as contrastive, that is, what we are is what other disciplines are not, and so forth. Uh, okay, so uh, when I talk about a discipline, I distinguish scope, domain, and definition. Scope is the reach, the phenomena that covers. Domain is its treatment of that, those, that phenomena. And then definition is a summary account. And if you, for example, say that post-war neoclassical economics is mathematical economics, the reach, the scope, uh, was extended by mathematical tools. Its treatment was in various mathematical methods. And uh, then some people have tried to redefine economics in that fashion. So 
When is there, however, enough change in a discipline uh, to say that it has changed? So uh, I move to, in this third bullet here, uh, the scope issue, the reach, how far uh, a discipline extends and say that uh, it may be that we'll see change in uh, the scope, but not uh, its domain. Much of uh, a field could still be defined other than how it, its reach might be extended and its definition as well. And I'll just talk briefly about behavioral. So behavioral economics is a change initially maybe uh, increasingly on the boundaries of economics. So the scope of neoclassical economics or economics traditionally prior to the rise of behavioral, the scope has been limited by a change uh, on those uh, boundaries. The reach of neoclassical theory has been limited by the incursion of behavioral. But uh, you could argue, and many do, that uh, mainstream economics with its neoclassical inheritance really is not much change in its domain, that is what it thinks it's doing and its traditional definition. So I use a core periphery model of uh, economics and change in it and say that first we see often the change in a scope that is on the boundaries or periphery. And then the question is, will we also later see it in terms of how that uh, uh, field is treated, its domain and its definition, its core. So I move on to the Jordi Cat char characterization of disciplinary forms, cross, inter, multi, and transdisciplinarity. And I uh, characterize this uh, classification uh, according to the extent to which borrowed concepts and theories from other disciplines change a discipline, and then whether there is also uh, significant interfield development. So if you start at cross, you have borrowing that has the least effect on a discipline and there's very little uh, uh, interfield development with whatever uh, discipline economics might borrow from. I'm sorry to race through this because uh, examples are really needed, but I don't have the time. And then as you go all the way to transdisciplinarity, you've got uh, a borrowing that fundamentally transforms a discipline and there is the arise between disciplines that are engaged in a, a, a a sharing and borrowing uh, a significant new interfield development. So I would argue classical political economy is an interfield development when we gave up a feudal economic organization and just price theory. Um, those two fields uh, 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 essentially abandoned. So it's really, as I put it, a movement from a more closed to a more open uh, type of uh, pluridisciplinarity, -discipline, uh, those four forms. I characterize economics as an interdisciplinary field because it, it's not as uh, closed as cross. Uh, it does borrow, but it doesn't have, it hasn't yet, it seems, had significant effects on uh, traditional understanding of economics. So we, we wait to see what the story will be with behavioral, whether or not uh, economics may move from its interdisciplinary status to more multidisciplinary one, uh, as I'll uh, explain in a moment. So now here's an issue. When we look at borrowing, uh, how do concepts essentially foreign to a discipline enter it? And are they tamed and domesticated or do they have transformative effects? So we need some kind of analysis of disciplinary boundary crossing. I think this is a complex topic that uh, we haven't really developed very seriously. And so uh, consider economics core as a closed type of system and its periphery as an open type of system. So there's many competing, some heterodox, some non-heterodox uh, approaches on economics periphery. It's kind of open, fluid, competing views, uh, more as I'll characterize it as multidisciplinary. Whereas the neoclassical core is quite regimented and systematic uh, a closed type of uh, system. So I've done work on Srafa and he says closed systems are only incompletely closed and they get completed by open systems. Uh, I won't go through that in detail, but the example is how commodity values in the Ricardian core uh, to do the formal analysis that he thinks needed to show 
what determines commodity values, you have to insert wage or, pri or profit values, but that's a different type of system than determines commodity values. Um, it's a dis distribution system. And so there is a uh, incompletely closed system that is completed by an open system. And I make the same argument with respect to general equilibrium theory and fixed point theorems, with that the latter being the open component, but racing along. Uh, so uh, we move to a more multidisciplinary type of field. Uh, if there is a heavy borrowing or boundary crossing uh, that a, a, a fairly closed system ends up uh, achieving by relying on other disciplines contents. And multidisciplinarity means that core periphery divide uh, goes away, boundaries become more porous, uh, many competing approaches internally, a complex system and a more pluralistic type of science. And this is the way I think many people characterize sociology. The question for me now is what might bring about a move from interdisciplinary to multidisciplinary economics? What external forces might bring this about? And I uh, talk about two here. The first are those concerning economics technologies. You see the three I talk about. And uh, these are research practices. And I consider these uh, external forces because they act on the organization of the science, not on the content per se. And then I talk about the World Values Survey as another set of external forces. And here I ask, how do popular expectations and social values regarding economics uh, possibly influence it? And there's two sets that I'll distinguish. Uh, in the Engelhart Welsell World Cultural Map Analysis from the World Values Survey, uh, there's a movement uh, as you go to more developed knowledge-based economies from traditional to secular rational values and from survival values to self-expression values. So those are the two sets of external forces. Here's the first one. Uh, it's these concern how economics is done, not uh, what it is about. And uh, here's the argument in the italics in the middle there that I make with respect to all three. The change in research technologies and economics are in each case, I argue, distancing economics from theory. So theory less important as these technologies become more characteristic of how people, economists do their work. Uh, and therefore we get a weakening of the core periphery divide because the core depends upon clear statement of what theory is. Uh, interdisciplinarity is weakened and economics relationship to other fields perhaps strengthened. And so I won't go through those three there. Hopefully you've done a quick uh, read of them, but that's maybe later we can talk about talk about it. That's my view of how economics is changing internally in terms of practices. Now we go to the World Value Survey and the first bunch is the emergence of secular rational values. How does economics stand up uh, when we look at this as a frame of evaluation for what economics ought to be about? Uh, well, if we look at rationality, optimization, and instrumental reasoning, uh, that's clearly secular rational. And if you look at the Chicago School work on family, religion, and government that uh, takes away traditional values, uh, basically economics is giving up traditional values, uh, uh, abandoning them, and become, has become a secular rational discipline. So it's consistent with this change in world social values, which by the way, are decades of surveys and uh, something worth uh, spending time looking at. Now, the second set of uh, values that are emphasized, the self-expression values, these are values that these surveys show that people care about. And uh, as we move to more post-industrial knowledge-based societies, you see the three there that come up in the survey. So I can't go through the analysis of the surveys right now, but take it from me that the ones that seem to be emergent are emancipative human empowerment and the idea of having an overarching goal or people expanding individual agency. And so mainstream economics, their self-expression values 
are, as you all know, subjective preference satisfaction. Uh, what preferences are, nobody's business. Uh, but uh, preferences uh, are not really uh, a sufficient characterization of what these three uh, uh, types of self-expression of values seem to involve. And so my argument is, is that economics current development is inconsistent with this external force potentially acting on economics change. Okay, now I move to the last section. I think I'm doing okay on time. So how do these two sets of forces uh, possibly change economics internally and its relation to other disciplines? Uh, the basic point is, is that the practices are the internal side uh, or the, the expression of, of internal development uh, and they concern how economics is done, uh, the social values, what it concerns. And so my view is, is that these two sets of forces uh, act uh, uh, act upon, sorry, this is not written uh, very clearly, act on the close nature of uh, standard mainstream economics as it is uh, now there, uh, that is open system types of forces. Uh, sorry for that. So I'll, I'll be a little more careful here, I hopefully. Research practices are a closed type of system because they're, they're quite regimented and disciplined. Uh, but in the type of open closed analysis I use, nonetheless incompletely closed uh, because they only concern how economics is done. When we talk about popular expectations, we're talking about a system that is, well, more diffuse in general. So of the nature of an open system. So these two sets of forces, they uh, sort of uh, uh, fit together uh, in that the more uh, disciplined, systematic, regimented practices, the closed system side of how economics is being done, uh, get completed or informed by this more diffuse open sort of system. So those, that's how I explain the interaction of these two sets of external forces uh, potentially operating on economics. Okay, so I'm coming down here to the end. I see the change in economics as a view from nowhere to potentially a view from somewhere. The view from nowhere, as methodologists argue and historians as well, gives us context-free abstract historical economics. A view from nowhere of economics makes it context dependent, historically and socially embedded. So the latter, uh, 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 so the view from nowhere conception really makes social values important. Uh, so what an objective economics is, uh, if it, we take it in view from somewhere terms, somehow looks at the role that social values play. And as a, a final point there, as you can see, I think this involves a change in the type of individual conception in economics. So if this change that I'm talking about were to come about, uh, the external forces changing, uh, what economics is about, the two sets of external forces and the way they combine and interact, we would see a, a, a reduced core periphery divide, economics uh, less disciplinarily isolated, uh, lose its interdisciplinary character, become more multidisciplinary, and you can see uh, what I say that uh, all involves. So last slide, uh, the topic of the paper is changing economics. And what is changing economics? So I like to move out of our safe space of academia where we do most of our discussion and ask how the world looks at economics. And I say, it's the historical evolution and development of the nature of economic life, which is a bit of a terror for us right now as we all uh, feel with climate change, pandemics, financial crises, and so forth. Uh, that's what's happening in the world. And there is a, a accompanying change in social values. And so I think the uptake society has on what's happening to us in fragile human life is that uh, it's expressed through the values that people have. And so the pairs of these external forces that I've tried to describe, the research practices and the social value change, that 
uh, I argue, will change the uh, pluridisciplinary, pluridisciplinarity status of economics, uh, ultimately values matter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Don't have very much in time. So now we have some time for questions. So they can come from the panel. I see there are already questions. So one question from Roger Michael. The move away from theory does not seem right. Big data, small ideas. What's, what is good about that? So perhaps the first reaction. And then was that, was that Roger? I didn't quite hear. Was it Roger McCain? Yeah. Yes, hello, Roger. Uh, well, I, my claim is that uh, theory is diminishing in significance. And that argument uh, may be hard to imagine when we especially look at the post-war uh, uh, history that we've uh, experienced. But I think that theory, uh, if you look at how young people uh, uh, credential themselves, uh, and I watched my econometric colleagues for years, uh, they're not worried about theory. They do all that technical stuff, which presupposes how they specialize, how they do formal modeling and so forth. The paper has more discussion of this, but that's my claim in, in any case. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another question from the panelists. Otherwise I have one. Annie? Yes, I have a question. If I compare your categorization with Uskali's, Uskali Maki's categorization, um, I can feel that you're not running after the same rabbit. We say that in French. I don't know if you say that in English. We don't have rabbits. What? We don't have rabbits. You're not running after the same fox or after the same whatever, moose. Uh, no, what I'm saying is that you the, the goal, the objective of the categorization is not the same. Could you be slightly more precise on that? Which is that, what is the link between your categorization, which resembles Uskati, cross-disciplinarity, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinarity. It definitely resembles some of the first papers that Uskali wrote on interdisciplinarity. Um, but you, you're not, you, the demonstration doesn't have the same goal. And hence, there is a slight difference between the two. Could you elaborate on that? Or is my question too not clear okay, enough? It's a, fair, it's a fair question. And uh, Uskli and I have sort of talked about different ways to approach these uh, categories. And what I have done is I have uh, tried to look at a progression from one more, most close to, uh, the, at the other end, the most open forms of disciplinary interaction. I don't think that's his objective. And so I have done that in two ways. Uh, the, the extent to which borrowing is transformative of a discipline, uh, so that boundary crossing question. And then secondly, whether or not uh, in between fields, inner fields are emergent. So as we get to the most open, uh, borrowing is transformative. And so that's my objective. And I, Uskli, I think has different objectives. So I can't exactly speak to what his uh, views are. Good question. Thank you. I have a question myself. Um, I was recently in a defense where the question was on the boundaries of economics, but this question was addressed, well addressed, but not in terms of pluridisciplinarity, let's say looking at the boundaries without looking at the interdisciplinarity. So my impression is that finally that work was much more on the changing in the space, let's say the domain of expertise of economics, instead of really dealing with the interdisciplinarity like in particular in the theory. So when you speak about um, uh, interdisciplinarity, are you really speaking about a concept coming from another discipline and then introduced in economics or the way economics address other issues? So let's say when you say you examine the scope, the domain, the definition, where is the expertise in your vocabulary? In the scope? In the, you see what I mean? Um, 
I think so, but perhaps not. Uh, I'm looking at boundary crossing. So that is concepts borrowed, brought in. So we can think of many examples, I'm sure. Uh, that would go also for uh, concept exports, boundary crossings, for example, economics imperialism. And the, the, the story then is a scope, the reach story, because if you have imperialism, uh, economics imperialism, then you're extending the scope. If you have reverse imperialism, psychology incursions into economics, you have essentially a contraction in scope. Uh, am, I, am I addressing what you're saying or no? no? Yeah, but then you examine also the way the concept is imported because let's say when Tyrol, for example, is examining uh, importing some aspect of psychology, he really uh, change them to make them compatible with his own approach, let's say. So mm. to what extent do you say that he really borrow a concept, import a concept? Or... Well, that's the, that's the question of, borrowed concepts being domesticated and tamed and fit yeah. to the say optimization framework or being disruptive and transformative. So the, the uh, cognitive behavioral psychology says the environment influences people's choices and fit that into the uh, standard neoclassical view. No, choice is an autonomous thing. You know the independence axioms that underlie uh, choice theory um, rule that out. So if uh, behavioral economics does become increasingly influential in economics, and we might that's where the rest of my paper comes in, why it might, uh, then uh, it's a transformative import. It's disruptive. It breaks down the core. And if the uh, interdisciplinary status of economics depends on keeping behavioral on the boundaries, on the periphery, and not allowing it to become uh, uh, determinative of the core, um, then that incursion is tamed and domesticated. I'm pessimistic that it can be tamed and domesticated, but I think the consensus for most historians right now is that uh, behavioral has had limited impact on the mainstream. Well, Alexander can speak to that better than I can. Yeah. Annie, you have another question or you just forget to answer? No, I have another question unless there are some participants who have questions. No, it's okay. And we have um, time for our last question. Yes, there, there is a question that I can ask now or which is definitely related to, to what I'll try to say in a, in a few minutes. Um, you, you speak about crossing boundaries for concepts or theories. Uh, I was interested, I'm interested in the paper I'm presenting on crossing boundaries for methodological devices, which is in my case, experimentation in the, in the interwar period. Um, but I think that what everything you say about how concepts or theories cross boundary and have this disruptive or transformative effect is valid for methodologies. Um, what, what I, I'm trying to work on is how this sort of experimental turn in other disciplines uh, in the 1930s, 20s and 30s are going to transform uh, and change the very nature of economic theory. And this is maybe one of the reasons why mainstream economics resisted to this, uh, to this empirical envy, to this experimental envy. But my question to John is, could you add methodologies, which is, uh, yes, research protocols or research techniques to uh, what you are saying with concepts and theories? Yes, uh, certainly. Theories don't come in because they're too big and, and structured and they are, uh, so it's, it's something that's more piecemeal. And when you talk about experimentation, you're really talking about a concept of, of investigation that yep. we can do a controlled analysis by isolating an environment in which uh, we do an investigation. And uh, that has been brought into uh, economics and 
it has been disruptive because many of the, for example, in the early research on the ultimatum game or uh, inequity and in aversion, uh, many of the controlled uh, uh, experiments that were done uh, produced uh, new ideas about uh, how people behave that were inconsistent with standard uh, selfishness uh, uh, views of, of agents. So, but the answer, yes, uh, maybe I was- They did uh, not only produce new ideas, they imported within the discipline some elements of uh, Welton Schung from psychology, from sociology, from anthropology, from other disciplines, who, which were using experiments before economics. So, so I think that there is, you have this, uh, the, this device of transforming the discipline by importing such and such type of experimentation from other disciplines that did play a role. What is interesting is that contrary to, to what happened, what Murovsky wrote in More Heat Than Light, what happened when, when you know, it came from mathematics, statistics, or theoretical physics, here it comes from many different disciplines uh, in the social sciences, in natural sciences, but also in the social sciences. So, so it is closer to what you are trying to develop in your paper than other examples. Yeah, that's an absolutely excellent point. And uh, I, I think that uh, you're entirely right that uh, when pieces cross boundaries, they have baggage that sometimes is implicit and not uh, the Weltanschauung idea that you, you said. It's some not, sometimes not recognized. So a borrowing process, I think, uh, has the intention of only taking the piece, oh, the technique of uh, controlled experiments, say, without uh, appreciating uh, that, well, you're, you're buying into to a bigger uh, thing than perhaps you appreciate. So yes, that's, that's important to explain transformative effects of borrowing. Yeah, in between, we had some comments from the floor. A comment by Roger McCain saying, giving the example of uh, econometric borrowing from medical and public health research, which could be example. And I guess they are example of theoretical uh, import, but also methodology. And Ross Emet is asking question. Thank you, Ross. He asked, uh, partly you already answered, is your argument is only about conceptual movement across boundaries, but you already answered a little bit. And uh, uh, he wonder also if some uh, historical story help with thinking about how discipline block or accept entry by foreign concept. And if you agree, uh, except if you want to have a short comment, then we can answer this question with the other papers. But if you want to make a short comment, join and then. We go to the next presentation. Yes, yeah, so so I'll, I'll make a very short comment using that blocking word. So domestication is an open-ended idea. How uh, the way in which our, the sociology of our discipline works, you can't get promoted if uh, you cannot get your PhD, you cannot publish, etc. If you're going to threaten various parts of the standard theory. So uh, there is a, a, a blocking that uh, is meant to preserve uh, core theory. But as Annie nicely just pointed out, uh, and maybe Roger's point about medical uh, uh, science impacting economics, is that sometimes when you bring things in, um, it's unexpected. There's inadvertent consequences, unintended consequences of what seems to be an innocent borrowing. So this all, this discussion seems to me to all go to this topic of the transformative uh, effects of borrowing. Thank you very much. So now we go to the second paper. It will be presented by Alexandre. So it's a joint paper, but Alexandre is the expert in bibliometrics. We cannot surprise anybody. I'm not the one doing bibliometrics. So I give the floor to you, Alexandre. I will give you Hi. a short uh, signal if at about 20 minutes. Okay, so thank you. <clears throat> uh, so I will talk about uh, this presentation about agent-based models in economics. 
Um, economics is undergoing a variety of transformation that are highlighted by uh, different parts of the literature in the last few decades. So in increasing diversity of methods, uh, often defended by uh, Davis, Colander. So you have experiments, uh, you have uh, randomized, randomized control trials, you have uh, agent-based models. Um, we find also an increasing computerization of the field with uh, an increasing applied orientation, uh, as John uh, just said. Uh, purely theoretical work are, as, are uh, becoming less important in favor of, of uh, more applied work. And finally, uh, there is also an increasing interdisciplinarity. Uh, despite the insular reputation, uh, it is often uh, advanced uh, that uh, economics is becoming more open to external influences in the last uh, few decades. <clears throat> These transformations uh, are the result of, uh, of a variety of research programs. Uh, some like behavioral economics, experimental economics, and among them we find uh, agent-based model, uh, which uh, is a field that is defined by uh, its methodology. So the use of agent-based model to discuss uh, economic topic that uh, has been imported from other disciplines, so uh, physics, complexity science, and comp computational sciences. Uh, in the literature, uh, in, in philosophy and uh, history of economics, there are two big challenges to better understand how um, agent-based models have impacted economics. Uh, the first challenge is to char characterize the cross-disciplinary nature of uh, agent-based models in economics, whether uh, it is a transdisciplinary new field, so really a new discipline that will be, for example, complexity science, and in which agent-based economics uh, will be a, a new subspecialty. Is it something that is uh, at the frontiers of multiple disciplines, so agent-based uh, economics, agent-based sociology, and uh, the interaction is only through uh, this uh, new speciality within discipline that uh, interdisciplinary interactions are happening? Or is it simply uh, an imported tool? Uh, economists take agent-based model and apply it to their own topic without caring much for what is happening in other social sciences. Uh, a, second challenge is, uh, a second challenge that is uh, more general is simply that it's difficult to get a precise idea of what is an uh, agent-based model uh, in economics. Um, there are no gel code, and often uh, the, the, the literature will use uh, different terms to identify the field. Sometimes we'll talk about econophysics, sometimes only about agent-based computational economics, sometimes about complexity economics. Obviously, there are uh, some overlaps. Complexity economics is the more general category, but uh, more generally, it's very difficult to find to, to find out what exactly uh, are we talking about because uh, there is no specific gel code, there is no specific uh, definition, which is made even more difficult by the fact that some uh, of uh, this new field, this new research program, are happening outside of economics such as in the case of econophysics, which is often published in uh, physics journals rather than economic journals. So the goal of the paper is to uh, exam examine the emergence of IBM in economics and investigate the way it spread to different areas of the discipline uh, and to find out how it challenges or not the frontiers of economics. So the first contribution is to give some empirical evidence on the evolution of agent-based model in economics. And a second contribution is to investigate the nature and homogeneity of the interdisciplinarity uh, taking place. Uh, to do that, we use a quantitative, a quantitative citation-based analysis of the field to investigate the structure. And we also uh, mobilized uh, some uh, epistemological tool from the, philosophy, from the literature and philosophy to uh, qualify the kind of interdisciplinarity we find. So first, let's talk about uh, the corpus. Uh, to identify agent-based model uh, in economics, we first took uh, all paper mentioning agent-based economics or agent-based computational economics in title, abstract, or keyword by authors, and uh, keyword plus, a feature of web of science that gives keywords to articles that are not explicitly uh, in the title or abstract, uh, in the title or abstract. We also took all the paper that simply mention agent-based or heterogeneous interacting agent but that are published in an economic journal. So everything that is published in an economic journal and that is agent-based is agent-based economics. And finally, we also use a different approach than just keyword by adding uh, 
Microsoft Academics article uh, that have specific tag. Uh, Microsoft Academics uh, assigned uh, topics to article that are detected using uh, some machine learning. Uh, and so we took all, all articles that are tagged by economics and the agent-based model topic or by the topic agent-based computational economics. This gives us a, a corpus of approximately 1,000 articles. And uh, to make sense of uh, this corpus, we identify the relation between the article by their bibliography, and we measure how similar they are by the number, the number of common references they have. So uh, two articles are similar what they share many of the references. We use this, this uh, similarity measure to build a relational network. And uh, we plot this network uh, with, diff with, uh, with a succession of 10 years overlapping windows. So 2000, 2009, 2001, 2010, which gives us uh, a multiple network that we can use to investigate how the field evolved uh, since uh, its emergence. <clears throat> Finally, uh, to make sense of uh, this network, we use dynamic cluster detection algorithm. So uh, to identify the cluster, the community of economics of economists that form around this tool, uh, we find the, the articles that are very similar to each other and very different from the rest of the network. And we find uh, among this community, which one are the most uh, stable uh, across uh, time, uh, across time to uh, focus our investigation. So first, uh, let's uh, get uh, an overview of ABM in economics. In economics. So the origin of the program is often uh, pointed out to be uh, at the Santa Fe Institute in the early 1980s. Uh, there was a transdisciplinary complexity program. Uh, and at that point, there were no economists. So, uh, but uh, there was a strong interest in the discipline that was thought of uh, as one of the first disciplines in social sciences that could benefit from a complexity approach and agent-based approach. In 1987, a workshop was organized with physicists and economists. And uh, this proved uh, successful because uh, a year later, uh, the complexity economic program was uh, started under the directory of Brian Arthur with the goal to study the economy as an evolving complex system. Uh, and in it, we'll find some agent-based models. In the early 1990s, uh, the goal was to apply different new methods to economics. So for example, to the stock market and to propose an alternative to neoclassical economics. Uh, for example, as expressed by Arthur, the idea is to use standard economics as a benchmark and to uh, develop an alternative model that would be more general and uh, considered better. After the 1990s, uh, it is uh, argued by Fontana that uh, when the directory changed from uh, to, to Durloff and Bloom, uh, a, lar a larger approach uh, was developed. And the goal was not only to develop a critical perspective on uh, the economic theory, but more generally to associate a subversive approach that criticized mainstream and uh, approaches that use complexity and agent-based model to extend the mainstream in new di direction. Uh, as expressed here by Bloom and Durloff, the idea is that the model presented here in the case of agent-based model uh, are not a rejection of neoclassical economics. Since the early 2000s, more generally, uh, agent-based models spread to different topics, journals, and institutions, and, uh, were not, uh, and are not limited only to the Santa Fe Institute. And so we find in the literature some of the first attempts uh, to classify the different uh, research directions in the field. So just to give, to give a quick uh, pictures of uh, these attempts, uh, sometimes, like in the case of Squadzoni and Holmes or Le Baron, We'll talk about uh, topics or area of application. So uh, agent-based models are used to discuss industrial, labor, innovation, macroeconomics, and finance. In other cases, we'll talk about uh, different paradigms within, within agent-based economics in relation to the origin in the case of Chen, for example, with uh, a market origin, an experimental origin, uh, a cellular automata origin. And uh, finally, in other cases, like in the case of Xing Plus, Uh, what is considered more important is the methodological approach in the way uh, agent-based models are used, 
with a deductive approach, an abductive approach, and a metaphorical approach. So the idea was to use a quantitative tool uh, on our part to find out the kind of structure that, uh, that uh, we find with this quantitative tool and how it compares to the field. So first, to get a big overview of the kind of result we get, we, 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 we have, uh, we here, here you have uh, all the networks uh, we plotted and all the clusters that are uh, found by the algorithm and their relationship. Basically, uh, the color represents big clusters that are very similar. And so we find four or five uh, big uh, group of uh, researchers working on agent-based model. So a first group dedicated to the study of finance. So uh, agent-based model applied to finance, one to macroeconomics, one to energy market. So agent-based model uh, applied to energy market. And finally, a variety of clusters that are uh, less uh, identified with one that is really dominating at the end of the period that we call the E and I, uh, which is uh, environment and innovation. So basically, agent-based model apply to uh, environmental questions. To get a better sense of the evolution of agent-based model in the early years, uh, we can get a quick look at how this network evolved by taking three snapshots, is that uh, in the early years, the really dominating topic was uh, financial market, which was one of the first topic uh, tackled by a member of uh, the, uh, the Santa Fe Institute uh, around the work of Blake Le Baron. And this stimulated uh, a number of uh, approaches, a number of work uh, quick, rapidly in the early 2000s. And this was really the dominant uh, field. The second dominant field was uh, energy market. Uh, which uh, is very separated from the rest of the network and uh, remains so uh, throughout time. But after the mid, uh, the, 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 the 2010 and the mid 2000, uh, two, in, at the end of, of the 2010, we observe a variety of new approaches with agent based applied to uh, microeconomics, to experiments, uh, to uh, 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 to, to experiment and to microeconomic question like game theory. And after the 2010, uh, and the, at the end of the 2010, again, uh, we find the same kind of cluster, but uh, the, the strength of these different clusters change rapidly. So while in the early 2000, finance and energy market were dominating, by the end of the 2010, uh, the two topics that dominate by far is macroeconomics and environment and innovation. Um, <clears throat> So we have these different topics within agent-based model economics. Uh, and the reason uh, why uh, they are used, uh, why we detect them is that uh, it's a way to, to structure our corpus and to investigate the kind of interdisciplinarity we find within this, uh, this cluster. Often we'll talk about, uh, often when we talk about interdisciplinarity in agent-based model economics, um, or even in all social sciences, we find the idea that uh, ABM is defined by uh, methodolo uh, methodological homogeneity with a practical orientation and a high interdisciplinarity. And the fact that uh, ABM in social sciences have uh, this homogeneity, uh, this homogeneous characteristic is often considered uh, a, a good characteristic for uh, disciplinary integration as expressed by Shen uh, agent-based model could become a universal platform for social sciences. So the idea is that because you have this, uh, this, this homogeneity in agent-based model economics, in agent-based model, uh, all agent-based approach in each discipline could be unified at, at one point or another, uh, whether in a new discipline or at least in a multidisciplinary manner. But uh, this, this perspective largely under, uh, uh, underestimates the actual tension surrounding knowledge transfer. Uh, as we said previously, when you import concepts, uh, it's difficult to import a concept uh, without any uh, content from the discipline uh, in which it is imported. But in the case of uh, methodology, um, sometimes uh, we think of, methodological, uh, of methodology as something that is uh, like a research field. So there is agent-based model approaches that is a research field with particular epistemic commitment. So one way to do uh, science, so it is a community of researchers, but we can also think of it as a method, so a tool 
that uh, like a hammer that you import and that you use uh, in the way uh, you want. So whether you import uh, a methodology uh, to, to import the, the community and to help uh, the community influence your, your own discipline or to create a new discipline is very different that if you import a tool to simply uh, adapt it to your, own, to, to your own discipline. So what we can do is to look at uh, each cluster and find uh, in each cluster the relation that uh, this cluster has to other discipline and uh, the kind of literature they discuss with by looking at their references. So here we have the share of references to other discipline in each uh, of the big cluster we identified. Uh, so just to highlight a few important uh, contrasting differences, uh, in the case, for example, of macroeconomics, at the end of the 2010, we find that almost 82% of the references in, in macroeconomics agent-based model are to economics and management. At the opposite, if we look at the cluster about environment and innovation, uh, it's around, uh, it's less than 40% of the references that, that, that are to economics and management. In terms of dynamics, of interdisciplinary dynamics, or at least interdisciplinary connection to other disciplines uh, by citation. Uh, in the case of macroeconomics, we have an increasing share of uh, economics. In the early years, uh, macroeconomics, the macroeconomics and based literature cited a lot of physics because uh, the few papers that are published in agent based economics are not, are not necessarily published uh, in economic journals. Uh, and you need to cite uh, physics journals to, uh, to import the tool, to, to adapt it, to explain uh, what is uh, agent-based macroeconomics. But by the end of the period, the share of uh, economics and management doubled and physics represent almost nothing. So you integrate the tool within macroeconomics uh, agent-based and you do not need to cite other disciplines as much. In the case of environment innovation, it is the opposite uh, trajectory because we find less and less economics and innovation. Uh, we find less and less uh, economics in the cluster. Uh, and instead, we find a lot more of uh, natural sciences, more generally. So a greater connection to uh, natural sciences rather than economics. So we find basically two big ways to, uh, to approach agent-based model in economics in this literature is that we first find a uh, first approach that is ABM uh, agent-based model as a critical approach of economics. In the case of uh, macroeconomics and finance and finance with some nuance, um, the articles are published in uh, very econ-centered journals, which are not the top five. So uh, it is specialized, uh, specialized journals. So the Journal of Economic Dynamics and Control, uh, Economic Interaction and Coordination, and Economic Behavior and Organization. But what you cite is uh, other economic journals, mainstream economic journals, so Journal of Finance, the case of finance, but mostly the AER, the QGE, the GP, the GPE, and Econometrica. Because this is what uh, you target, this is the kind of literature uh, you want to address, you want to contribute to economics, or uh, as uh, John Davis might say, you use agent-based economics, you import the tool from the outside to criticize the core of economics. And this is what we find in the literature, even in programmatic writing, uh, as expressed by, by Gatti, for example, the idea is to propose a new paradigm and uh, or uh, by Fagiolo and Roventini, the idea is to escape the strong theoretical requirement of new neoclassical models. Uh, as you can guess from the name, uh, macroeconomics uh, agent-based models is also very geographically situated. It is very European. We find mostly Italian economists uh, in, uh, and along with some French. But uh, it is a very uh, well-identified community that form around the tool that has a specific goal, that has a specific way to do interdisciplinarity, and that is geographically situated. So we find a well-identified community with uh, instrumental, instrumental methodological borrowing approach you borrow a tool to, uh, to criticize, to criticize the, the econ economic theory, but there is no intent to, to have disciplinary integration. So you don't want to uh, integrate economics with uh, physics or uh, with uh, natural science. 
at the opposite, we find that in, in other clusters, the idea is to use ABM as a critical tool uh, of frontiers. Uh, in the case of energy market, for example, we have a well-identified community. There is also instrumental methodological borrowing, but a potential hybridization, hybridization with an applied perspective. So the idea is that you publish in economics, uh, in specialized journal in energy economics, but the literature you interact with is uh, the, special, the specialized literature in other fields uh, in relation to uh, energy. So the idea is to, to create a community around the tool of agent-based model economics uh, with an applied perspective. And finally, in the case of environment innovation, we have unstable community, as, as you saw from the first graph, it's like a little bit everywhere, because uh, what we want to study here is agent-based model in economics, but in this community, it's not just agent-based model economics when you think about uh, agent-based environment, environment and innovation. What we have here is a critical restructuring interdisciplinarity, that is that you import tool and what you want to do is to challenge the usual way you think about discipline. The idea is to have a potential integration or, or at least juxtaposition of discipline within environmental sciences, because even if you publish in ecological economics, environmental management or revolutionary economics, what you want to contribute to is generalist uh, science journals like Science, uh, PNAS, uh, Nature, and uh, environmental and ecological Specialist journals. Uh, as expressed here in the literature, the idea is that modeling the economics of climate, climate change require methodology from social and physical sciences. And uh, this is an effort that is further and further uh, from the mainstream of economic thinking. Or uh, as expressed more explicitly by Rosser, while we have combined economics and physics and economics and biology, uh, to create a new areas of uh, global climate economic modeling, we need uh, a, tr a new transdis transdisciplinary model, so a new transdisciplinary field that associates that, that associate all of this approach. So while it will be tempting to conceive agent-based model in economics as either a subfield of the discipline like behavioral economics or as a speciality of social sciences uh, ABM, of agent-based uh, model social sciences, in which economics will be uh, only a part, we show that the way uh, the, this knowledge transfer from uh, physics and complex sciences to economics happen uh, encompass a variety of relatively heterogeneous approaches, with, in some cases, like micro and finance, you import a tool to criticize the discipline. And in other cases, like energy, environment, and energy, you import uh, the tool with a critical perspective on the traditional boundary of the discipline, whether because, whether because you want to have an applied perspective on a specific uh, subtopic, or whether you want to create a new transdisciplinary field. In both cases, criticism are directed at a particular idea of mainstream economics, but they are fundamentally different in nature. So thank you for your attention, and comments are very well. Thank you very much, very much on time, less than 25 minutes. So we have a, we already have a few questions from the audience. So first, uh, there is the question, so why um, we let outside our sample the Orkut work in 1955? And uh, then the first point, perhaps we can answer quickly, is because the databases we built was not uh, encompassing this period. And that uh, I would say that we did not try to have really the history of agent-based model. Otherwise, of course, we have to mention this, uh, uh, this pioneering work. But we really focus on the recent development of the literature because it became much more intensive from the Santa Fe period. So we start there. Even from the Santa Fe period, we do not try to, to offer real, really an history of that period. Now we just take some yeah. references, some points to understand the process, and then we try to look at what was produced from that period. You want to yes. add something? Yeah, um, yeah and more, more, specifically, more specifically, it's also about um, the kind of thing you can find with this method, because um, what we used here is the keyword approach, so basically uh, words like agent-based computational economics, and uh, this kind of, uh, I, call, I call it brand 
uh, this, uh, because uh, it's a term used by Earl, Earl uh, Peter Earl, but it's like you will talk about brands of research programs. So, for example, uh, you have behavioral economics, experimental economics, neuroeconomics, and these brands um, make a research program very easy to identify and community very easy to identify. Uh, the point of uh, pre the prehistory of agent-based model in economics is that you find a lot of things that are happening and that stimulated the literature, but uh, it's it's hard to qualify it as agent-based model at agent-based computational model uh, economics before uh, even the terms and concepts existed uh, and before uh, these economists consider themselves to be part of a research program. Uh, that uh, really emerged uh, in the uh, uh, 1990s, uh, clearly. Okay. And then we have a question, comment from Roger McCain. Thanks for your nice comment first. And then you, Roger, ask about the collaboration with such uh, sociologists. Then I'm not sure about what you want to say. Does, do you mean that uh, you have to, we have to trace the influence of sociologists and economists, or you are speaking about the tool we could have used uh, as author of the paper on sociology? You have an idea, Alexandre? Uh, I'm not sure if it's the, yeah. the collaboration with sociologists for uh, the methods or in agent based yeah. model economics. Exactly, I'm not sure. So perhaps you can add a little bit uh, and you can elaborate a little bit your question. I'm not sure about what you want to hear about. Are there other questions? Okay, so I do not see additional comment from Roger. So I propose we go to the next paper. And then if you have other questions on that paper, we can address them later. So, Annie? Uh, Annie, ton micro On est... On pas, Annie. Somebody has to stop the screen sharing. They tell, I'm told that I cannot do it while somebody. Uh, okay. Yes, it should be okay. Perfect. Uh, let me just close this. I have, okay. Can you see the, so um, do you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, first, I would like to thank Ross Emmett for putting together these sessions uh, at the ASA meeting. I would like to thank Muriel for putting together this specific, specific session and um, present this paper, which, is, which was first a historiographical paper. Uh, the idea being, wait, oh, I cannot... I cannot move my slides. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry, I have to. Yes, I, it's enough to do that. Um, it was a, a historiographical paper, and I was sort of uh, mad with the, the, the history, the diff various histories of experimental e economics, uh, which were mainstream history of a field as a subfield and uh, including a paper that I wrote with Samuel Ferret, where we did took over this same history. And in fact, uh, reflecting upon the interdisciplinary aspect of this old story, this prehistory of experimental economics, um, I tried to build another story uh, which had nothing to do with precursors and nothing to do with the history of a subfield in economics, but which had to, to do with uh, the history of a methodological device, the history of a tool. So uh, section one, the insider's history, I'll be brief. Second to another history uh, with different narrative. Uh, and uh, I shall, with different lengths, 
uh, I shall distinguish bit boring to Leo Corey's distinction, an image of experimental knowledge, which was developed in the 1920s and 30s, um, and a body of experimental knowledge, and this will be the longest part of my talk, with very many different types of experimentation in very many different disciplines. And basically it is the, this whole very fuzzy and blurry set of experiments, which at the end, uh, uh, how do you say that, convinced economists to adopt some experimental methodology. So first section, how economists uh, only begun, what is the internal, internal history? Uh, how economists began to experiment in only three major fields after World War II in difference curve, market designs, and choice theory. And this insider's history is developed by Vernon Smith, by Al Roth, by Moscati, who is a historian of thought, but who, who does buy this internal history and list and Lewitt. So in this history, and I shall be brief, um, the, um, the, the major precursor are Bernoulli, Thurstone, Chamberlain, and Allais, of course. Uh, let me put my... Okay, um, so I'm not going back to uh, those different experiments. We all know about them. Uh, first, the St. Petersburg paradox. It is a game. It is not an experiment, even in a very broad 20th century sense of the term. The second experiment is very interesting and I shall go back to it because in fact there was quite a lot of experiments around this question of choices and preference where some psychologist offered psychological experiment to economists or to management theorists and this specific experiment is when Henry Schulz at Chicago asked a specialist of psychometric, psychometrics, a psychometrician, Louis Leon Thurstone, to construct an indifference, an indifference curve. So uh, the explicit question was, uh, uh, was about the future of the two disciplines. It's the very interesting point of the paper, which is the idea that psychology and economics should join together and uh, find a fertile field of investigation. But the questionnaire that Thurston built was a one time and one shot questionnaire with one subject and a choice between hats, coats and shoes. And it was definitely not uh, what could be called an experiment. Uh, third example, uh, the theory of monopolistic competition by Chamberlain was not well received. And this definitely looks like experiments when Chamberlain engaged into classroom experiments from the 1930s to the 1950s. So this, this event is for me the most interesting. And the last one, of course, is uh, Maurice Allais' paradox experiment, which is not an experiment, which is a hypothetical questionnaire addressed to some researchers in a, in a conference on risk and choice theory. So the, I basically do not agree that these precursor, first, I don't like the, the notion of precursor, these precursor make a prehistory of the field of experimental economics. There was no constructed common project. Each of those precursor had his, his or her, well, his in that case, own agenda, and the methodology were extremely different. So uh, the idea is to build another, uh, another story and consider experimentation in the interwar period, not as the construction of a future subfield of economics, but as a tool which, as John would did say before, will have a transformative effect on most of the disciplines where it will be applied. So my departure point is a veto that everybody knows now uh, by John Stuart Mill, where on the definition of political economy and on the method, 
of investigation proper to it. He writes very clearly, there's a property common to almost all the moral sciences, is that it is seldom in our power to make experiments in them. So basically, as we all know in the system of logic, Mill advocates in favor of induction and experiment as the only proper scientific method, but a method which is not valid, can, cannot be applied for what he calls moral sciences. What we would call, sorry, uh, I have to go how... Um, this veto by Mill was definitely followed by most of the classical economics. I just take two examples, John Elliot Kearns, uh, who argues that uh, the utter inadequacy of the inductive method is related to the fact that it is impossible to experiment in economics. And Neville Keynes, uh, who also uh, uh, advocates the idea that it may now be asked how far experiment is possible in political economy. Uh, there are problems that lie only in, on the threshold of economics, even with some kind of experiments is possible. Our power of controlling and varying the concomitant circumstances is very limited, nor can the experiment be freely repeated. So basically, in Europe, in the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, uh, there was a strong opposition towards the possibility of experimentation in social sciences. The debate will be very different on the other side of the Atlantic, and this will be my third section. So in this third section, I shall have three, three parts. Let me move to the, to the first one. First, the institu institutionalist movement. And we all know that the institutionalist movement advocated in favor of a much more inductive approach uh, than the deductive nomological approach, which was carried on by most mainstream economics of the time. One of the origin, which is seldom uh, referred to is the legacy of purse. Where, I mean, th th there is a strong link. There's a, a very nice article, an old article by, by Murovsky on the link between institutionalism and pragmatist philosophy. And uh, Pierce was a, a very strong advocate of in favor of experimental research. He conducted himself a set of experimental research uh, when he was working for the US Coast and Geodetic Survey. And he wrote at length on the benefits of experiments in favor of the, the new epistemological framework that he was advocating around this notion of abduction. This influence uh, led uh, some of the institutionalists, not all of them, mostly two of them, to advocate in very strongly in favor of economics as an experimental science. The first, both positions were taken in 1924. Uh, the first uh, strong position was held by Mitchell, who was president of the American Economic Association in 1924, and who devoted about uh, a fifth of his presentation to the AEA to the necessity for economics to become an experimental science. The obsolescence of the older type of reasoning in economics will be promoted, blah, 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 coming over, thinking about human nature, and he develops the idea that economics should be an experimental science. Of course, um, speaking of experimentation, I do not forget, says Mitchell, the difficulty of making experiments in the social sciences, but he says that there is a way, and this is the research program. If we want economics to turn into a real science like the natural sciences, the idea is to develop experimental techniques. The second institutionalist who's, of course, much less known, well known, is Tugwell. Tugwell put together a, a series of articles, extremely interesting in 1924 also, the trend of economics where you have night, you have institutional, you have a, a, a wide range of authors on the, the state, the current state of the discipline. His own article is entitled Experimental Economics and basically, 
He argues that the assurance of rightness in science is to be found in the replication of experimental results. So Tugwell, who doesn't have a very sound definition of what experiment should be, is a very strong advocate of uh, the, the necessity for economics to, uh, to develop an experimental, an, like Mitchell, he underlines the difficulties, the difficulties are obvious, uh, with the obvious impossibility in most cases of controlling experimentation. So he develops this. But basically, there is this very strong experimental envy, which is expressed both by Mitchell and by uh, Tugwell. Four years later, he goes on in the journal, a set of articles, I just quote one. There is a set of articles in the Journal of Philosophy where he develops the idea that uh, workers in the social sciences can be divided into two groups. One wants to go into the experimental, in experimental direction, and uh, the other one are basically the old, old school mainstream economics. The second importance, so this was for the image of knowledge. In between the image of knowledge and the body of knowledge, there is an extremely important episode, which are the, the 10 years, uh, well, eight years, seven years, where Bairdsley Rommel was appointed director of the Laura Spellman Rockefeller Memorial Fund. He was very young, he was 27, and Bairdsley's Rump, Rump soon hired uh, uh, also young, older than him, a 30 years old institutional economist, Lawrence Frank. And they both, Bertrand Rom wrote a report on the, on the fund and uh, Frank engaged into a review of the social sciences in the United States. And both defended the notion of experiment as the only way of having a modern social sciences in the United States. And hence, they advocated rather successfully uh, to the, the Rockefeller Fund in order to fund laboratories uh, in many different academic institutions all over, a little bit in Europe, but mostly in the United States. And this is extremely important because experimental research supposes laboratory, laboratory are, are expensive. So, so, so the, the funding, there were many, many fundings for research in the US in the Ito war, but the funding that these years, it stopped when Rummel left the fund in 1929, but from 22 to 29, there was a huge amount of money devoted to experimentation in the North American social sciences. Let me take now some examples and we'll see that it covers a very wide range of the social sciences. First time, not first type, we have many first types, but experiments which were extremely uh, uh, widely publicized were experiments in agriculture. So there were many agricultural farms. The origin came from England, uh, the Rothhammered, Rothhamsted Manor, uh, owned by John Bennett Laws with a young chemist called Gilbert, where they hired Fisher and they developed um, Fisher statistics and randomization techniques very soon. Uh, the, the, those techniques arrived in the United States uh, basically in the end of the 19th century. There, is, there was the Hatch Act of 1887 to encourage research and to create experimental station in agriculture, which widely developed, published in a journal uh, called the Journal of the Proceeding of the Agricultural Economic Society, which was widely read by economists and also published in the American Economic Association, the GP, published in, in important economics journal. This is one of the points I would like to make, which is that mainstream economists could not not know what was happening around experimentation in other, in other disciplines. The second one was, of course, industrial economics and workforce management. There had been quite a lot of experiments on time and motion studies, 
we all know the, the pictures of a, a horse running and a man running. We all know the works of, uh, of uh, Lillian and, and Frank Gilbreth. Uh, but the most uh, well-known experiment for reasons which are not linked to the experimentation is the Hawthorne works, uh, the Hawthorne works management, uh, which engaged still in 1924, which is an important date for this experimentation envy, in a series of studies um, on the productivity of labor and the question of fatigue. We were in the midst of the Taylorian methodologies and, and there was a lot of problem in workers' labor productivity had gone down. So these first experiments did not work. They called upon a group of researchers from Harvard with a fatigue laboratory which was interdisciplinary, which was chaired by Lawrence Henderson to take over the experiment and bring academic expertise on the ongoing research. Uh, and from then on, you really had uh, uh, within the factory, within the walls of the factory, it was not a field experiment. It was a lab established within the factory with very strict protocols on uh, the question of productivity. So there was not only an interdisciplinary matrix, but the Hawthorne experiment served as another matrix for another experimental disciplinary association between labor economics, physiology, experimental psychology, industrial sociology, personal management, and the field will be called industrial relations. A third example, experimental psychology applied to business long before Thurston's experiment, which has been documented in many, many books on the history of experimental economics. There is this, this, this professor, associate professor at the University of Chicago, Forrest Kingsbury, uh, who wrote two or three articles on the theme of applying psychology to business. And this has never been documented, where he tries to apply experimental psychology to uh, what he calls business problems which is a question of choice, question of organization of labor, question of management. What is interesting in these articles is that the, the experimental protocols are very precise. I'm not entering in the detail, uh, but, but I have many quotes where he really tries to, to use all the lessons of uh, psychological uh, experiments which had been going on for about 30 years then, and he tries to use all the details and apply them to business. Other experiments, education, not only in the economics of education, but in education as a whole. And so, and there were also experimental protocol. There is an experimental study of economical learning. Economical learning is not learning in economics and economic Lucas is, is a way of learning. There is all the work of an education psychologist at Columbia, William McCall, who organized some experiments on learning, used randomization technique. And there is, which is interesting because she was the wife of Mitchell and Mitchell was very much involved, Lucia Sprague Mitchell, who founded the Bureau of Educational Experiments in New York City, together with Wesley Clare Mitchell and, and another colleague, Harriet Johnson. And uh, they, there she, she developed experiments. The, those, those experiments in education were quite often destined to women. And she developed a set of uh, experiments inspired mostly, she often quotes, uh, John Dewey in her writing on those experimental protocols. Uh, psychometric measures of preference. Uh, before Thurston, another one, it, the, a psychometrician of the University of Nebraska published again the publication in the AER. So you cannot say that economists did know that. Uh, measuring human wants in business or psychological yardstick for economic values, where he discusses the validity and reliability of three methods 
I quote, as a device for measuring economic values as based upon human judgment. So basically, what this, ex this only experience by Thurstone uh, is surrounded by other works uh, and Guilford is, is he's slightly younger than Thurstone, but he would succeed him at the head of the psychometric association. He's one of the, was one of the important uh, psychometrician of the time. How much time do I still have, Muriel? I'm not looking at them. No, I can't hear you. You have to unmute. Sorry, uh, normally three minutes, but you can okay. have five minutes. So, uh, so this is for Guilford. Uh, sorry, proof, proof. Uh, I forgot, I'm sorry, my title. Uh, another domain where you had a lot of experimentation were home economics. Uh, home economics was a very interesting institution, which now is beginning to be well documented, uh, where uh, departments of home economics allowed women trained in economics to teach and to conduct research in economics whereas they were not accepted as professors in the economics department. Um, so the, the, the tradition is rather old. The, the founder of home economics is Ellen Richard. Uh, this was in the late 19th century. She founded the American Home Economic Association. What is interesting is that she was trained as an industrial en engineer and environmental chemist. And since the very beginning of the discipline, she insisted upon the necessity of developing experiments in sanitary engineering and domestic science. Basically, all those women, it was mostly women in those department of home economics, tried to apply the Taylorian rules to the domestic sphere, but uh, by, by inventing new experiments to adapt those those rules. Three other names, of course, Hazel Kirk, you, you all heard about her, Margaret Reed, uh, who was Kirk's PhD student at Chicago, and Elizabeth Hoyt, who was professor at Iowa State University. They all developed this domain of home economics, which was definitely, this is why I, I mentioned that Margaret Reed was tenured in Chicago as professor of home economics and economics. Home economics was considered as a department of economics, even if there was no gel code and it was not considered as an important domain. Uh, one last example, inquiries on the cost of living consumption patterns against a lot of women on those in this uh, Elizabeth Waterman Gilboy, she had questionnaire she was a very well-known agricultural economist. We've seen that there were a lot of experiments in agricultural economics, and she carried on experiments and questionnaire on the request of the Harvard Committee on Economic Research that she was, where she was vice, pres vice president. And she computed and charted the result uh, using randomized technique. Blanche, Jessica Blanche Peixoto, also questionnaire on academic family budget at the University of California at Berkeley. And um, outside of the academic, Margaret Loomis Tecker also researches on family budgets and cost of living. So what I just, I don't want to be too long. Uh, what is important is that you had strong methodological discussion on the status of experiments in the various social, social sciences and on the status, possible status of experiments in economics. Uh, so to first conclusion, uh, there was a proliferation of experiments in various social science, psychology, sociology, management, anthropology. I forgot political science. I had to. It was too long. Political science, education, agricultural economics, labor economics, home economics, consumer economics. These experiments had already the dual purpose that experiments have today, which is one, to test theories, two, to design new institutions and policies, which was definitely 
very visible in agricultural economics or education economics. Exchanges and crossing at the borders of the different social science had a strong transformative impact on each of these this, I, I, I join what John was, say, was saying before. There was definitely a transformation and a disruption in each of the discipline. The second, my second conclusion is how can you explain the agnotology, the ignorance from on the part of mainstream economics in this interwar period? First, uh, experiments uh, were, were done in unconventional areas of economics, although there were publicized in the American Economic Review, QGE, GPE, Review of Economic and Statistics. So the subfield of experimental economic did not emerge as an institutional field, but the methodology was definitely there. In these different various field, marginal fields, experiments were conducted either by heterodox economics institutionalists or some home, Hazel Kirk in her thesis is very critical of neoclassical economics, uh, or by economists trained in another discipline, and I would add, or by women, which were not considered as important in, in the profession at the time. Third, they implied a different conception of economic behavior than the mainstream conception. Um, and uh, well, and I can, I, I know that Muriel is going to shout at me if I go on. So basically from a theoretical point of view, the reference uh, were from the, the image of knowledge, it was a, for economists, it was a theoretical project and not an applied. From applied from the body of knowledge, these experiments were interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary limited to local subject and contributed to question what was the major theoretical dogmas of mainstream. Thank you for your attention and I'm waiting for your criticism because I'm struggling with this subject and I don't know what to do with it. Thank you very much. And so there was there are some questions from the floor. We were perfectly in time, so we have time for questions. So I do not see anything for the moment for the question. And so John and then Alexandre. Thank you. I cannot Annie. hear you. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. You can hear me. Thank you, Annie. I think it's uh it's very fascinating to see this uh, history uncovered. Um, the questions that you raised at the end, why it didn't have more momentum or the issue that you raised at the end is one that is provoking. Uh, I remember you gave a paper at an HES meeting a number of years ago on the Hawthorne effect, which you, you referred to the Hawthorne experiment, but the Hawthorne effect might've had a dampening, uh, the recognition of it might've had a dampening uh, effect on the conviction that experiments were useful. But uh, let me also ask you a, a bit more about Alvin Roth. So Alvin Roth, of course, uh, made the concept of exchange different from mainstream thinking when he uh, did the kidney exchange analysis. And this is a, a social question. There's social values operating on what economics ought to be able to achieve. And I wonder if you can comment on both the Hawthorne effect and Roth's influence by uh, taking up socially important issues. Um, so um, as, um, I was fast on that because what, what I wanted to show in this presentation is the, the, the very astonishing multiplicity of experiments. So they were not experiment with a strict protocol as 50 years ago experiments would enter a strict protocol. Each experiment had its own type of protocol. Some had very fuzzy protocols, but they, they were very strongly, which did not exist 50 years before, uh, experimentation in the United States in very many social sciences. And of course the whole fun effect was one of the important experiment. Why was it important? First, because uh, it came from the fatigue laboratory 
which was an essentially pluridisciplinary laboratory where you had doctors, you had economists, you had physiologists, you had uh, sociologists, you had people like Elton Mayo, who, who was anthropologist and specialist of management. You had a mo you have mathematician, you had statistician. So the lab, the fatigue effect, which is a, an institution for which we, we would need a, a I've been dreaming of, of writing a paper on the fatigue laboratory since long because it's a very interesting. So it's the people from the fatigue laboratory who comes in a, in a, in this this plan, this industry uh, near Chicago, and develop the Hawthorne studies uh, with what is just has been has been known in the literature, which is the idea that the question is not the the object of the experiment was. What happens if the light change in the workshop on the productivity of the of the workers? And in fact, what matters was the attention that those little Harvard, very chic, uh, very young researcher came and they say, oh, Mary, you have a nice dress today. And oh, Joan, how is your grandmother? And uh, this is the reason why the productivity raised and, and not the question of lightning. So basically it changed the type of management. So the question, it's not only a matter of in, in question of interdisciplinarity. The question is, was this part of economics? Is the question of labor productivity an object for economic theory? The answer should be yes. But is the, the empirical question of labor productivity, how does it work? Is it a, a subject of interest for economists at that time? No. So what is interesting in the Hawthorne effect, like in most of the other, the other subjects that, that are the topics that I took as an example is it has to do with the boundaries of economics, and it has to do with very fastly moving bound. Home economics was not economics. Agricultural economics was not economic. So now, as historian of economic thought, we realize that some, some basic concepts in finance uh, were done in, in, by agricultural economics. There's a lot of work on that. So home economics developed also concepts and theory, but at the time, it was not considered as important within uh, the field of economics. So it is extremely, it is extremely interesting on, on the theme of the, of the borders. So, so this is how I took the Hawthorne experiments in this, in this paper, not in the previous one. Uh, your question on Roth, uh, I want, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm extremely interested by Roth's work in experimental economics, and I agree with this question of social values. I just picked up his history. He was, uh, he was uh, in, his, in the, the handbook of experimental economics that he edited, which was one of the first major handbook after Vernon Smith's one. Uh, he has this history of experimental economics, where you only have those precursors. You have Bernoulli, you have Thurston, you have Chamberlain, and you have Allais. And this seemed very narrow as a, as a, as a history. So as a, as a good reader of Foucault, I don't like the notion of precursor, of course. But apart from that, the idea, it's, it is not those mini experiments uh, which pave the way for what will become a real experimental turn after World War II. It is much more, in my opinion, all those experiments all around in very different social sciences. And in that sense, uh, experimental, the experimental turn is totally different from the borrowing of uh, uh, what one neoclassical borrowed or from uh, psychophysics, Weber Fechner law or from uh, physics, theoretical physics, uh, the supply and demand uh, uh, mathematics, or when, uh, when statistics came to economic. I mean, each time there was one discipline involved. What I'm trying to show there is that you had a lot of disciplines who would practice very differently. The most important, of course, was psychology, social psychology, experimental psychology. But you had a lot of other disciplines where the people did experiment in social sciences, where they were not supposed to be able to. And it is this, this, uh, this matrix 
that allowed at the end, the economist who were the very last one to, to consider that it would be possible to experiment in their field. I'm speaking of mainstream economists, not heterodox economists. Did I answer your question? Not really. I can't Thank hear. Uh, then we have Alexandre. Thank you, Annie. Um, <clears throat> so, we, like you said, the, at the time, uh, discipline were were less closed off, and I could imagine that it was uh, more common to to do uh, work within economics that use a method that were not uh, widely used. Um, but where these at attempts that uh, you paint as episodes were uh, all independent? Were there uh, any attempts to build a more general approach uh, within these uh, episodes? Or do you consider that this episode could be example of uh, the independent uh, attempt to use experiments uh, in economics that show that there is some continuity that many people thought independently of uh, experiments in economics as something that could be useful? And uh, that uh, and that continued up until there there was something happening in economics. So this is my first question, or or whether it is a more general, uh, or whether there were more general attempts to bring a, to to build a community around this tool or something like that. So this is my first question, and my second question is: uh, So do you think there are uh, similar episodes? Uh, between the interwar period and the emergence of experimental economics? Or uh, do you think that there is something happening in the interwar period, something happening with the emergence of experimental economics, and then uh, really no relationship between experiment and economics at all, even in the more marginal field, or, uh, or everything that was attempted before moved to other discipline, or I mean, I don't know. So is there a continuity that we can establish? Yeah, thank you, Alexandre. Before your answer, there is also a question from the floor by David Mitch. Hello, David. And perhaps it's in the line not so far from what uh, Alexandre is asking. He asking perhaps the term experiment require further elaboration. My sense is that current experimental economists impose a lot of structure on what they set up, for instance, on replicability and so on. So perhaps this is uh, linked to some extent to the question of Alexandre of the possible link or distance between the two periods people develop experiment economy. So, yeah. um, so the, the first the answer to the first um, question and to the second, which is definitely related, is simple. No, there were these were episodes. In, diff in each of the disciplines, of course, agricultural ex exper experiments, there was, if you take the Journal of Agricultural Economics, there was in each issue, you had, uh, they related one experiment, they discussed the protocols. Home economics, Hazel Kirk, who was the first in this period in the United States, uh, the first uh, important character in home economics, devoted some articles on the methodology of experiments, statistics, and how, how do you deal with data? How do you collect data? And how do you, how do you, do you process data? So there was locally a uh, very, uh, uh, very sound discussions on the methodology of experimentation, on the role of experimentation, on the limits of experimentation in each of these disciplines. Not only there were no general project, but first mainstream economists who had all the, the possibilities of being interested in that, again, because the articles were published in the major economic journals or in other journals that that were widely read by academic economists. Mainstream economists did not touch experimentation in the 20s and 30s. Absolutely. The only one, the only examples are Schulz asking Thirst Tone and Chamberlain, but the other ones were definitely not interested and, and stayed on the old John Stuart Mill's veto. They advocated in favor of this abstract deductive nomologic methodology. But this was very much related to the fact 
that their opponents were advocating for experiments, institutionalists were advocating for experiments. And so, and they were attacking mainstream economics for their wide, too wide abstraction. So no, there was no project, but there was no project uh, one experiment when experimental economics began to be built as a subfield, as an institutional subfield, the, the subfield was not homogenized and, and institutionalized before the 1970s. I mean, it was definitely, you take Ale, Ale was discussing with Savage, not with the others the gaming people, the people who were the flawed and, and Drescher who were discussing with Nash, they were discussing with Nash, not with Ale. And so experiments was sort of one methodological device used as a rhetor rhetorical device, but, but most of these people did not get into experimental economics. The, the one who really unified the field and, and made experimental economics a field was Vernon Smith. And it took him about 15 years after World War II. So, so, so it took quite a lot of time to arrive to the point where we are now where experimental economics is subfield, has gel codes, has journals and all that. It, it took much more. What, what, what I'm just trying to say is that the it did not only begun after World War II. I think those experiments in social sciences were a sort of a matrix, were an envy. It was, it was, not, a, it was not institutionalized, but, but it definitely. Uh, and I did not get, I'm trying to, to see uh, the Q&R. Uh, I did not get the second question. No, As the, the question was, um on the definition of experimental economics. Now people impose a lot of structure on the paper, a lot of constraint about replicability and so on. So to some extent it's a more restricted definition perhaps of what you can call or not experimental economics from the uh, period you are referring yes, to. Yes, of course. Well, you have to see, you have to know that today Experimental economics does not follow the same protocol than psychological economics or that psycholo the psychological experiments or, or medical experiments. So protocols can be different. Second, I would say that some of those strict protocols like replication, controlling one variable were already discussed in the 1930s, 20s and 30s. Third, uh, what is considered as very new today is the fact that experiments at the beginning were supposed to, to, to test existing hypotheses or new hypotheses or new theories. Um, and that after, only after they, they, they are conceived as designing new policy, policy uh, frameworks and things like that. In the 20s and 30s, the two functions were very clearly at stake. Some experiments were there to test some theories, others were there to just design, try to find uh, uh, a good way, a good practice in agriculture, in experiment, in home economics, in whatever. So, so that you have a lot in common, uh, but the, the unification of the domain is does not exist before the 70s. And this is why I mentioned the, the Laura Spellman Memorial Rockefeller Fund. Uh, the unification came very much when uh, major uh, funding uh, foundations got involved into experimental economics. Uh, before that, you don't have much. And in, in, the social, in the social sciences, the, the role of Rommel was Rommel and Frank uh, was definitely important because they they carried this idea. If you, if you can fund with so much money uh, laboratories in experimentation in social sciences, it is a, a very strong way for the United States at least. It is a very strong way of legitimizing the those those methodologies. There is on the chat the last comment by Bud Collier who say that the round health insurance experiments, the negative income experiment should be included. 
yes, but it's uh, in in if if I remember well, uh, the the negative income experiments happened after World War II, and I tried to I tried to stop apart from the precursor I included Ale because he's always quoted. Uh, I tried to to stay in the twenties and in the interwar period. I have but just a course. very short, a very short question. At the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned the financing, the financial support by the Rockefeller Foundation. Mm -hmm. And are they very much responsible of, um, let's say, did they give a, a strong support to this, uh, this field? What were the financial support of experimental economics? Was it was it universities, was not, private? Uh, it was not experimental economics. It yeah. was experiments in social sciences. Yeah, yeah. And again, it was all the examples I took were related to economic themes, objects, preoccupations, where they part of the economic discipline. I, it, it is very difficult to today, especially, to say this is economic, this is not. I mean, when the articles are published in the American Economic Review or, or in the GPE or in the QGA or whatever, whatever. So were they economic, were they not? The, they were funding experiments in education, in agriculture, in, uh, they did not fund in home economics. They were funding experiments in social sciences, not exactly in economics, because uh, uh, they were also funding uh, statistical work and inductive work as a general as a general framework. Uh, so they funded the NB Mitchell Mitchell's NBER and the Coles Commission. So they gave money to to statistical work, but I'm not speaking of statistical work. Okay. I'm speaking of experimental inquiries and this randomization of results. It is, it is technically uh, a very different um, protocol than uh, just gathering statistics like in the, in the NBER. But they did fund laboratories in Chicago, in Harvard, they funded the fatigue laboratory, of course, Chicago, mm -hmm. Harvard, at Yale, if I remember well, I don't have the list now, but I read the, um, I read the, there is some, there's, there are some books and articles on the, on Birdsley Rum's moment, those 10 years, well, not 10 years, eight years, uh, in the, in the Loris Pellman Memorial Fund, which, which were very important for experimentation. It was even this, I would say it is, the, it was, this is it. Okay, thank you very much. I see no more questions from the floor, no more hands. So we have five minutes in advance, so perfect. Perfectly in time. I guess it's lunch time in the US, so bon appétit. Dinner time in Europe. Yeah, <laughs> aperitif time in Europe. <laughs> so thank you very much for your participation. Thank you, John and Annie, also Alexandre. Thank you, Muriel, Many for your thanks chair. Thanks for the various questions, and I hope, deeply hope, we could see each other very soon. Really soon. Well, on on the on this question we have in in the the the, the Paris conference, I hope you'll be all. I hope John will be able this time to to come to Paris, and in May it will be sunny and no with no COVID. Hope so. I Hopefully. Hope. Okay. See you all of you. Have a happy soon. new Thank year, you. all of you. Thank you, everyone. And it Ciao. was a lovely session. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you all. Thank you.